Hey there, everybody. This is Jay Frost speaking to you, of course, from the Philanthropy Mastermind series. If you've been to this party before, welcome back. And if it's new to you, welcome to the room. Uh, this series has been going on since 2016, and we have over 500 programs. And of course, as we have been delving into the world of ChatGPT, this is the second session on that topic uh, recently, um, you'll find that we are trying to keep up with what is a rapidly evolving world. And we've got an incredible panel put together by our colleague and friend in the industry, Nathan Chappelle. I'll be introducing each of those people to you in a moment who will be telling you about uh, uh, today's session and introducing this concept uh, to you, um, some of the frameworks for using ChatGPT. Um, now, of course, if you want a recording of this, as you probably saw a moment ago in those slides as we entered, uh, and you'll see at the conclusion of the presentation, there will be a recording of this available for you over the donor search site at the conclusion of the presentation today. And additionally, there are other recordings from others in this series that you'll find there as well. Um, you can also participate in the conversation today in two ways, as you also saw alluded to earlier, and that's through the chat, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And I hope you'll use that right now to just warm up the air and let us know that you're here. Perhaps just say hello to our guests, uh, let them know where you're coming in from, maybe which part of the country or the world, uh, which organization you're with. And then also, as you have questions, please put those in the Q&A so we don't miss them. So with that, I want to just take a second to introduce our panel. You can see them all uh, up here on the screen on the subject, which once again is new frameworks for evaluating advanced tech and nonprofits, a deeper dive into the pros and cons of ChatGPT. If you haven't used it yet, you'll definitely want to try it out after today's discussion. We have with us, of course, Dr. Kenna Barrett. Uh, she is a nonprofit leader, a TEDx speaker, uh, who's been helping introverts make an impact. You'll see other sessions that she's been kind enough to provide for us in this series over there at the donor search site. She has a PhD in um, a natural language processing. That's a very reductive way of describing her work. Uh, and she's also the chief development officer at University Libraries of Maryland. We also have with us, of course, Mina Das, uh, who's a community data strategist who helps nonprofits advance human-centered data insights through Namaste Data and Data is for Everyone. And we also have, of course, uh, Tim Sarantonio, who is an internationally renowned speaker on subjects related to generosity, tech, trends uh, in social good. And he's also, as you may know already, the Director of Corporate Brand at Neon One. And then finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the author of the book that's sitting on the shelf behind me, Generosity Crisis, is Nathan Chappelle, who's also the senior VP at Donor Search AI and uh, an innovator in the field of using AI for fundraising and development. So with that, I want to pass the baton over to Nathan. Nathan, take it away. Thanks so much, Jay, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We are in our part two of the promise and perils of ChatGPT. And and as someone who kind of finds themselves a bit uh, sometimes uh, ahead as an early adopter of head where the market is, um, I'm not surprised that our our uh, attendance is, is a little shorter or less than last time. Last time we had over 400 people. Um, but as we unpack what ChatGPT is and, and the advantages and disadvantages of it, um, if this is a webinar that I really think is going to be formative for our industry, not just for the audience today, but as it's recorded and put on YouTube, because I, at, out of all of the webinars I've seen on ChatGPT in the last two to three months, I've not seen any that really are diving in deep to talk about the differences between the short-term advantages and the long-term implications of what this technology will do for our sector. And as someone who obviously, uh, as Jay said, wrote a book on the generosity crisis, I'm very interested in macro trends and what's going to happen, not just today, but, but long uh, um, in the future. I'm so honored and excited to share space today uh, with uh, Kara, Tim, and, and Mina. Um, I am honored because of their expertise in the field and what they have to contribute to our field. Um, and for their time and, and willingness to trust me to help guide this conversation in a way which I think will be very um, organic and engaging. And, and as Jay said, I really want to encourage participation from the group. And so please ask your questions and um, allow us to, as this group, respond from our different vantage points. So obviously, like I said, there's no shortage of uh, ChatGPT videos. I looked today and the current count is 87.7 .7 million videos. So this will not be a session on how to use ChatGPT because there's 87.7 .7 million videos for you to go on YouTube and figure out how to do that. 
Um, there is an art and science to using a generative AI like ChatGPT. Um, and as BARD is now coming out with Google's uh, version, this is a world that we're gonna live in. Uh, the idea of, you know, um, prompt engineering and, and really being, you know, mastering kind of the art of, of using a tool to your advantage. But this session is really gonna be about, again, that more macro view of what's working and, and what's not working. I think this is something that as we, um, as consumers in the world, as, as people, I think all of us would consider ourselves technologists on this call to varying degrees, either early adopter or late adopter, we'll get into that in just a second. Um, but we are all faced with this idea that the speed of adoption, the speed of that technology is confronting us is, it almost feels exponential. That, you know, we talked at our last, our first session of ChatGPT1 about ChatGPT, which is built on GPT 3.5. And within that time, that short few weeks in between these sessions, GPT 4 is out, which has actually has increased GPT 3.5 by 40% in its kind of factual uh, adherence. And so, again, it, it turns out also that I'm not sure if the audience knows, but Chat uh, GPT 4 has been done for seven months. It's been done for seven months, been sitting and being tested and refined. So, Again, I think this is something that is so important. I don't think this conversation could be more, more aptly timed. I think this conversation about how we are, are faced with advanced technology and how our sector is evaluating that technology is what I'm really excited to get into today. So again, um, please participate with your questions. And I just wanna jump in here. I asked this question last time and I was actually surprised by the panel's response and we'll see um, from this panel. Um, as far as that question, early adopter, late adopter, somewhere in between, I'm curious to see where you're all at in this, um, given your willingness to be on this, this panel and to talk about something that is modern day technology. So um, Kenna, you're on my, my left, so we'll start going left to right. So um, uh, no right or wrong answers. Early adopter, late adopter, where do you find yourself? Do you buy the latest iPhone? Do you sit, you know, spend the overnight at the Apple store waiting for it to come out? Or do you wait a few years until it, it's out? Well, it's funny you should ask. So I'm I'm a somewhat of a Luddite. I did do a dissertation on an NLP system that was a machine learning program to score essays because I was in the rhetoric and composition field. So I was a humanities person, but I looked closely and ran some tests on this AI. Um, so I'm not necessarily someone that's out there like, let's try this, but some of the things we found in the system, I think are relevant to this conversation and just having a deeper understanding of how machine learning works, even if it's at kind of the surface level or you don't know what the algorithms are or you're not a computationalist. If you at least understand something about how it works, you'll understand like why it can deliver really good results and then why some of the stuff it gets, gives you is just a little bit of gobbledygook. <laughs> we can get into that a little bit later, but I think I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be here because I wanted to represent the humanities and the ethics sector as it were in saying we can, we can understand these things to the extent that at least it'll help us understand why it's working and why it's not. So that's a long way of saying I'm, I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> That's that's awesome. Thanks so much. It's exciting to have someone who did their their dissertation on this topic. And when was that, by the way? Like like this was pretty ahead of the time. This was 2015, and the system, yeah, was designed to score essays. It was not generative AI, but it was machine learning. And just one of the things that they that that was found, and I replicated, was that it was picking up. It was scoring essays on an artifact, which was essay length. So the hot, the, lo the longer essays tended to be better. There was some, somebody had more content to share, but that system was not looking at the content. It couldn't, it didn't have those features in its, in its, in its suite of things that could measure to actually right. look at essay quality or content. So then people realized you could game it and make up anything as long as you wrote a long essay. <laughs> and so that was really a problem for that system. So, sure. um, so yeah, that that was it was 2015, but now of course things have have even advanced and said a lot. Obviously, the, with chat, the speed of change is is just remarkable. Yeah. All right, Tim, you're next. Um, next up, uh, and and really, you you always surprise me because like I would say early adopter because like you like cool stuff and you like that, but but sometimes like you're kind of this you're, you're interesting fellow because like sometimes you surprise me. So 
I, 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 I think I think I know what you're getting at. I uh, am also a Luddite to, to Kenna's point in many ways. So, um, you know, I'll just quickly take my camera here. I have books. I like books. <laughs> I do not read anything on a Kindle whatsoever. I buy everything to um, maybe the detriment of my bank account and also my uh, bordering on hoarding. But um, my father is a science fiction author, mm. actually. He's written over 50 books and he's written Westerns and, and um, horror and he worked with Stephen King, but he edited Ray Bradbury. And Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, all of these people had a very interesting influence on the very topic that we're talking about. Right. And that always was very, like I talked to Ray Bradbury's wife as a kid, right? It was a very interesting childhood. So I had this, this man who lived in my house and he would type everything out on this and it would come and be books, mm -hmm. right? So I think that helped inform me on that fusion of uh, early adopter versus late adopter. For chat GPT, early adopter. Mm. I'm paying for it yeah. now like yeah. i threw 20 dollars at them and said give me access to chat gpt4 um but it's been interesting in general because some of the things that i think we'll touch on here i don't think it's useful for and a lot of it borders on that creative yeah. element yeah. the imagination the dreaming yeah, yeah. You know. that's so interesting and that explains a lot about you tim i mean it I does I, you know, it all is coming clear, you know, now I, yeah, the origin story, this isn't some yeah. mystery, right? Yeah. Like, like we yeah. know why Dr. Doom's angry. Right. right. So, and, 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 and before we go to Mina, I mean, it's just interesting because and we talked about this more in the last session, but ChatGPT is really kind of the, one of the first forms of interactive AI. And so yeah. it feels science fiction in so many ways. Like you watch the Jetsons, which I've been rewatching. Um, it just, my weekend is just all AI, like all weekend, every weekend, like I, I movies bet. and Jetsons. And, and it's just so interesting because there's something that has captured this imagination of this, of what we've, we've read about in these sci-fi books for like, since we were kids. I right? think it's the it's first really time because, because it's generative language and then white men shut up. Okay, Nathan. So because it's generative language, it opens up the real possibility of storytelling. I think for the first time. And I think that's why it's clicking. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Mina, Mina and I met, I don't even know, I guess we're going a couple of years ago. Um, and it was, it was kind of like this, just like love fest at first sight because this, her approach and her view of like data for good technology for good and people that know Mina and have gotten to know her know that she just has a way about her that just brings community. So Mina, um, with that, I know you you have a lot of friends um, out in LinkedIn world and um, in your subscriber base and Namaste data. What early adopter, late adopter, somewhere in between? You know, I have three advanced computer degrees in AI and machine learning, but I am the same. I don't use Kindle. I have tons of books. I'm hoarding it. I still use my Samsung phone. I took like um, six years ago. Uh, people would think someone like me would want to be an early adopter, but I am not. I prefer to use the term something like conscious adopter. So I would, you know, nice. try and test things out and see how it goes. With Chat GPD, I would like them. I'm also early adopter. So I have tried different inputs to Chat GPD, asked it to write a poem for me, a story for me screenplay i'm one step away from getting it to tell me i love you and i will get it <laughs> to that but i'm definitely testing out things in different ways so conscious that's, adopter that's that's amazing well uh, that's awesome thank you all for sharing that i i feel a little you know left out because i've been an early adopter to my own detriment for like way too long i think you know the person who downloads the the beta versions of things and then totally gets burned because my computer's crashing all the time or my phone won't turn on. Um, I I've actually tempered that a bit as I've gotten older and wiser about which things that I should be an early adopter about. But I I've um, always kind of had this fascination, more of that sci-fi fascination of like like how can technology enable um, work and how can it enable humanity and how can it be used? And, and really, obviously, my focus has been how it can be used for good 
and not evil. Um, and I, I tend to remain optimistic about, about all, all of this, but I do believe that it requires guardrails and, and thoughtful conversation. What, one of the things that I was very interested, again, like you, early adopter of ChatGPT, um, and I, you know, I found people that were just jumping in the deep end of the pool without any consideration of just, I'll use it for everything versus, oh, well, let's, let's wait and see. I do think it's fascinating because I was at a conference a few days ago and I asked the group just out of my own kind of in inquiry and research, how many of you of this nonprofit group are using ChatGPT? And it was about 2%. And so um, some of the comments that came from that is like, well, how do we know what to pay attention to? Because things like crypto were all the rage. Every, crypto, 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 everything's crypto. And where's crypto? And so if you're not an early adopter or you're not, I guess, uh, a cautious adopter or, or have this, this desire to like learn more, um, it can just feel like it's just another shiny ball. It's just another, I, and I do believe that there's a lot of people in our industry that are just kind of wait and see kind of approach. And I want to start getting into data, um, basically, well, ethics, but also the equity aspect of it, because from a, a pure equity perspective, those that use it versus those that don't will be a differential that is going to grow, I believe, exponentially. And so let's start there in kind of that conversation of, of data equity um, from that perspective. And I know Amina is probably thinking about so many different ways to take this as well. Um, is this something that you're thinking about? Is this on your mind as you're thinking about the nonprofit sector or even your own use of, of ChatGPT? And whoever wants to go first, um, I don't want to keep on going down the row and back because it will feel kind of routine. Um, who's Who of you is this on your mind? Or should I call on someone? All right, Tim, you go first. Yeah, me, I was going to say you. Okay, so <laughs> well, Mina and I are are, are probably, um, you know, I love working with Mina. She's going to be doing some some great stuff for us uh, next month, I believe, on uh, donor and data surveys and data. It, it, you know, where my head is at on a lot of this access stuff. I, I, you know, it was, it was inevitable to see the first company roll out and say, we've built it in to our product, here it is. And, and that happened in the for-profit space. I wasn't surprised to see HubSpot have something. I wasn't surprised at all and in the least to see what Microsoft did. The Microsoft presentation was stellar one of the best product marketing presentations i've ever seen in my life and of course it comes from the people that were able to sell excel in an elevator back in the day right mm -hmm. with that commercial but the fundraising side the moment i saw one tech company say it's here and it's going to start generating appeals that's where i got concerned yeah because one the models definitely are not trained on donor data donor psychology donor insights but we are just not there yet by any means to have it start populating things that are directly tied to platforms that sole purpose is to generate money. Because what's right. gonna happen is it will say, oh, we're doing this for the donor, but it's really to get the donor's money. And it has no conception of the human element there. And that was the part where I'm like, too early too early. Um, it, uh, how do you know that the, the language models were not trained on donor psychology? I mean, Nathan, you can maybe speak better to that or somebody else, but I haven't seen anything that's specific to that. Yeah, I mean, I, in a way they are to some extent, right, to the, the amount that's available to the general population, but in proportion to all the information they're trained on, it's minuscule. Yeah. And so really, to, to your point, Tim, if that if you're intentionally wanting to use this to augment fundraising, you need to train your LLM on lots and lots of language around. And, and I'll, I'll say one quick thing on this. So one of the things that we did was we partnered with um, a gentleman named Chirian Koshi, who's in the sector, a uh, nonprofit operating system. Um, and, and part of AFP, just absolute dynamo when it comes to ethics, equity, and all these types of things. And where we started was, he used those language models to analyze subject lines from over 30,000 emails that came from our client base. 
from 1400 right. plus nonprofits. And we didn't say generate subject lines. We said, understand sentiment and emotional tagging and let's see if that is on the right path. So it's not that I'm even against this type of stuff. It's been how long? Like there is an impossibility that we've gotten the level of nuance needed for generative language for identity centric appeals in donor psychology, philanthropic psychology. Like Jen Sheng would probably agree. I'm not going to speak for her, but I'm pretty sure that's what she would yeah. say. And let's let's have Mina go last. Um, Kenna, what's your take? I mean, you've studied this, you know, like formally in your PhD. Um, and you brought up something, in, you know, well, you brought up a few things online that I think are just like really important to think about as we're evaluating this, this tech. Sure. Well, and feel free to remind me <laughs> what I said on my book. <laughs> One thing I did want to say related to, um, to what Tim just said was um, I did actually ask uh, I asked both the Microsoft version, so I guess that's based on GPT-4 and GPT-3 about identity congruency. I wanted to know if I was a regular user, could it tell me anything about philanthropic psychology? And that is, as people may know, like Dr. Shang's um, finding was that uh, people tend, may make a, a larger gift when someone that they kind of feel they have something in common with makes larger gifts. So they, they found this in these really interesting experimental settings uh, that you, you know, of, oh, if I really identify with Nathan, you know, he's my buddy and someone, oh, Nathan just donated 300. Well, maybe I was going to do 25. Right. <laughs> I might be shamed into doing $30 or $50, you know, so, so that's identity congruency. When I asked chat what it was, it said that congruency was between the donor and the organization. So that seems really like it makes sense, but it's completely wrong. That's not right. what that theory is about. So I think my big thing is just wanting people to understand that it does not know a lot about this sector. Now, part of it's because a lot of the research is behind paywalls. I am the CEO of a library, so I understand how hard libraries, um, academic libraries are working to, to get out of those, those paywalls, but that is a reality of the publishing, publishing industry. Yeah. So it can't find out everything by just looking at the internet. Um, and the concern, really, the framework question I think you know, I have is, how can this technology um, help the most vulnerable members of the NGO community, the smallest organizations, the beneficiaries yeah. that need our support the most? Um, somebody that had the privilege of going and reading about Jen Chang's work would go, oh, that's just bullocks. It doesn't know. But if you don't know and you're not sure, um, then it's providing these reasonable but false um, con content to you. So I think that's one of my my biggest concern is just that everyone understand like what was just said, where these things are. Now, could they be trained to understand this? Yes, because it understands Star Wars. Getting back to sci-fi, it understands Star Wars really well. <laughs> it told me no yeah. Dumbledore is from, um, from J.K. Rowling, <laughs> Harry Potter, and sorry, Mr. Spock is from Star Trek. It knows so much about all this publicly available stuff, but it comes to the nuances of our sector. So we need products that are for and, and by people in our sector. That's what I would say. That's great. Yeah. No, thanks for, thanks for adding that. Uh, Mina, what's, you've kind of listened to all this. What is, how are you kind of distilling this kind of conversation around I mean, both the data equity, data equality, as it relates to a kind of the haves and have nots of, of, uh, of this tool for the nonprofit sector? You know, my biggest concern with this product is, um, and I'll take it a little bit basic, Kenna and Tim has um, already established this, but I'll take it a little bit to the basics. So how these models are working is it's taking a lot, it's learning from the basis of a lot of data that already exists on the internet, right? And I'm making it very simple. It's probably more, more complex than that. It's definitely more complex than this, but it's it, these models are learning from a lot of data that already exists out on the planet. It's learning from there. It's producing stuff and then chat GPT produces, the generative AI produces its answers. When we use these questions and take these answers, we are producing something and sending it back to the planet. So it's like, you know, we, it's like a cycle. So it, it's still learning from the same things. An example would be LinkedIn has launched, I don't know if any of you have seen, LinkedIn has launched a collaborative article where um, it produces chat GPD articles and right. it gives yes. prompts to content creators to say, okay, now you input your stuff and- I know. If and it, it, it gives um, points. If you can get the most likes, you would get a badge of um, community top voice or something like that. Um, 
And that's my concern that we don't know, we don't have that human intervention, we don't have that governance, we don't have, we're not checking what it is producing. And we are probably trying to give carrots to be engaging with it without realizing what are the long-term implications of it. So um, I like to engage with it, but like I said, I'm a conscious adopter. So um, that's kind of my concern on how we are producing this stuff and how we are trying to use it. There needs to have some sort of a common intentionality, um, fundraising yeah. or not, for that whole I act. Such all of you, such such great words of wisdom. I mean, proceed with caution, kind of right, as far as kind of the name of the game. And and to your point, you know, the interesting thing about AI, you can train AI on anything, but it doesn't know the difference. But if, are you training it on things that are what in AI is called true positives? Like, is it is it true or untrue? ChatGPT doesn't know. Are those fundraising appeals that it was trained on were they effective or were they horrible? It doesn't know, and it can't distinguish between the two. So it's to your point, Mina, regurgitating all that it's heard in trying to make the sense of what has been the most common, you know, words and phrases that have been used, but doesn't mean they were effective, you know? And then I think to your point, as you're talking about like this, this kind of proceed with caution, I mean, social media has been around for a while. Only now are we understanding, a decade later, are we understanding the implications that social media has had on society? And that's why I think this conversation, and I hope this is like, this is going to live in virtual world. So people will like, if they're looking for ChatGPT, good or bad in the nonprofit sector, do they'll find this, this webinar to start thinking through what are the things we're gonna regret in, in, a, in a decade from now of like, oh, we just jumped in and we didn't really care if it was wrong or right. We just jumped in um, without really having thoughtful conversation. I mean, it, it looked like you were gonna say something else. Yeah, I wanted to jump in with one another thought, Nathan. Um, that was the part that we have been talking about is equity. And I know we are going to talk about access and equality, equality yeah. in those pieces. But here's my another concern. If chat GPD like models are learning more, have data representation more from one part of the world, one kind of data, it's always going to produce answers and you know options which resembles more to one part of the world. How do we ensure whatever it is producing also has representation from other communities that don't have access to these technologies. And then, you know, when they create their voice, whose voice comes through that data into those answers right. that these generative models are producing. That's another concern. Um, I want to throw it yeah. out there. And in and, and, and wanting to make sure that this whole webinar is not a total downer, um, we will end on a high. So I promise if you're listening, um, we're gonna, we're really, I wanna dive in deeper on the things that people aren't talking about, but we'll also, we'll end in talking about really some positive applications. As far as this kind of the, the access to tools, and I, I feel like this digital divide is now like on steroids, right? Because if, just a, a very easy example, if you're a college student um, that maybe doesn't have your own computer or doesn't have access to the internet, versus next to a, a, a college student who does and has ChatGPT, your work is now completely different. Like overnight in the last two months, like your the, the ability of you to create or to, to deliver really, really solid work is, is um, it's, it's profound. And so kind of, I'll phrase it this way to the group. And, and, and you like this or don't like it anywhere in between, tell me, nonprofits, uh, okay, we'll go. AI will not replace fundraisers. We'll just use fundraisers. But fundraisers who use AI will replace those that don't. We hear this a lot in the private sector and other. So nonprofits that use AI will replace nonprofits that don't. Do you? Do you? Is, you know, so we're talking about this equity issue. Agree? Disagree? Well, I think there may be some orgs that have better AI, <laughs> you know, and that's that digital to digital divide. Um, I, I guess I worry that, you know, the people that already have fewer resources, the ones that maybe they weren't, they couldn't hire a copywriter. So all of a sudden you have a, a, a tool to help you write content, um, but maybe that content isn't really what a copywriter would have done. Well, the big universities, the big nonprofits are probably going to be able to afford customizable tools, you know, the kind that really could look at um, at a bunch of annual fund um, results and kind of trying to analyze what worked and put together something really tailored. But I worry about the smaller organizations again. So that divide is what kind of AI we're using. That's what I wonder if, if, if other people would agree if that's what's going to happen. 
it, it, it comes down to control over the means of production in many ways, Nathan. It's, it's who has access to these tools and can execute these tools. And that's also where having them baked into products, regardless of, you know, they could be affordable, they could be not, things are coming into search engines and, and whatnot. Yeah, it, there's going to be quality divides, just like there were quality divides in uh, list management for mailings before, before a CRM or a donor management system and after a donor management system. And not everybody even has a donor management system. 97% of the entire nonprofit sector in the United States is under $5 million in revenue. And so equity has to be at the center of everything that we do here. And the big yeah. concern, and this is not necessarily a bummer town, but these are all being produced and heavily influenced by for-profit companies, the United States government for military purposes, and academic institutions like Harvard. And again, not necessarily bad to the surface, but Amy Webb, a fantastic futurist, talked about this in the book, The Big Nine. And we have to recenter it toward their, their overall goal, toward the commons. Sure. And that's why we, Nathan, you helping drive these conversations, these types of things is so critical because we should be at the center of these conversations. We need to be, we have to be. I mean, we, and, and thanks for bringing that up, Tim. I mean, obviously I'm extremely biased in this because I wrote a book about it, but there is a lot to lose. Like things are not healthy in an industry as it is. And if we start trading a human voice for a, a robot, you know, communication, uh, we're not going to dig ourselves out of this hole. Like it's going to take, you know, this, I, I posted this on LinkedIn a while back, but like sounding authentic is not the same as being authentic. And uh, Tim, you mentioned that for-profit company that mentioned, you no longer, it literally the quote was, you no longer have to write donor acknowledgements. And I like got sweaty. Oh, I'm like, no, oh, I think I missed that horrible. part. Oh, sure. Yeah. So good thing you missed it. Cause I literally like had cold sweats when I, I heard this, but again, to the big nine uh, part of that is that, the motivations of big tech is like, well, we could create efficiency for you and it's going to make your life easier. And so let, we'll get into short and long-term advantages in just a second. Uh, Mina, anything that you wanted to add uh, as part of that last conversation? Yeah, just two points probably. One is we are never going to replace the human emotions. And we have already established that. It's always going to be there. That messiness of being a human, as much as we are trying to replace with good AI tech, it's never going to happen. We are, we are going to get close and we are going to talk about how to build um, sustainable, good relationship with AI technology, but we are not working to replace us, the love we have for this world. That's point number one. Point number two is any nonprofit right now listening to this conversation or would be listening in the future, I don't want you to think that you need to start adopting AI because someone can replace you. I want you to adopt AI because it has some potential for you to build better relationships, which you're already doing to be better at something with that abundance mindset and not because you are going to be um, replaced by another nonprofit. So, so smart. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the motivation- Frame, frame that, frame I know. that. That's... Put that on, a, put it on a bumper sticker. I. It, it's so smart. I think that is, um, that's the missing element right now for a lot of people. It's like, you know, are you going to use it to compete or are you going to use it to, you know, enhance your ability to, to, you know, draw that connection. So um, we're going to, we'll spend a little, little bit more time on <laughs> the negative because again, like, I, I guess I've just made it a thing in my career. It's like, let's embrace that and, you know, whatever, but we'll, we'll end on a positive. What is the worst possible outcome of, of the nonprofit sector eyes. Um, the worst possible outcome of the not for the nonprofit sector with ChatGPT. Let's just go there. Can I start with that one? <laughs> yeah, for so, sure. The worst possible outcome that can happen for our industry is if we don't use it. You surveyed people and two people raised their hands. That's the worst possible outcome. We want our industry to try it see it for themselves, how is it going, test it out, form an opinion, form a thought, and then jump into the, the conversation. Um, so for me, I would say like in one sentence, if I have to pick, the worst thing would be if we don't try it at all. Mm. 
I guess I'll just, I'll go. Sorry, Tim and I yeah. are always doing it at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe it's that we lose the connection to why we got in this in the first place. So someone on one of the LinkedIn boards said something I thought was so brilliant. And her name was Marina Munoz de Martinez, who's another consultant. And she just jumped on something I posted and said, you know, there's this, you know, there's a, there's a movement, the ethical storytelling movement, which is really about when you're, you know, making appeals or you're trying to raise money, but you're, you've kind of forgotten whose story this is that you want to tell. How can that person be involved in whether you tell and how you tell it? And it's not just a narrative of someone was really traumatized and our organization helped them and it's fine now, you know, that, that it's, it's hard for people to talk about their trauma and, you know, we have to really be ethical. Is that what we're really supposed to be doing? Really think about this. And, and, and that this is just one more piece that kind of takes us away from being humans and, and remembering yeah. that we're helping humans and that we're not just fundraising to get more money and, and hit some dollars and hit these goals. But there's there's real people that are being helped or harmed by what we do. And so, yeah. you know, we just hope that AI can take us closer to, as, as Mina was saying, closer to the real people that we are working with and closer to our communities rather than farther away. Yeah. Tim, I was just giving you a couple minutes to think about the worst possible outcome. Yeah, you know, it's probably not a, a smart thing for me to do, but let's go like put on your uh, sci-fi hat there. What's the worst possible outcome? It destroys the sector. The worst possible outcome building on top of everything that's been said is that either it doesn't get adopted in ways like what we heard from the other two panelists and we end up turning everything effective is ultimately the most efficient transactional thing possible and the for-profit world wins takes over our sector and everything becomes service capitalism okay that's 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 the worst possible outcome or it just accelerates the uh the vision that social responsibility should be handled by uh either other entities and that nonprofits should not be trusted with this type of technology and only the most well-funded, resourced and effective, basically or the worst possible outcome is effective altruism wins because of chat GPT, basically. Those are all uh, great comments. I, I heard this term, you know, reality apathy. And so we'll kind of get into this a little bit and this idea that, I mean, Mina, you brought up this idea that, you know, and I heard about the plugin for LinkedIn. I haven't seen it yet, but the, immediately, I think you might've been the one that shared it with me. It's horrifying to think that we're just going to robots talk to robots. Like there's no, where's the human in any of this, right? And and I think in the private sector, it's like, who cares? Like, whatever, like, I that's fine. But when trust is a currency of the nonprofit sector, it's, it's all based on authentic, authenticity and trust. That is that is our currency. That is our premium. And having bots talk to bots, you know, I always have to put on my hat of the 51% of Americans that don't give to charity. Why don't they give? They don't give because they don't feel like they can, that they're either the money is needed, that they, they, that the organization actually care about them. And if we use technology like this to this point to just to, to create transactions, then I agree the outcome will be what you said, Tim that it will just be, we will remove ourselves from the sector by just allowing fundraising to be completely transactional. I've been thinking a, very deeply about this because I've been reflecting deeply, deeply on your book. I think your book is extraordinary. This isn't a promotion for the book. It's that good, okay? He didn't pay me to say that. I love what you've, you've talked about. And for me, the answer to a lot of this is what I call the generosity experience and to design around that and to think about that. But it's not the money, right. it's understanding the core why. And you have to start with the person first. Who is it? And that speaks to what Kenna and Mina have been talking about in terms of centering and storytelling and access and equity. And that's my concern is that if we misunderstand that the core reason that somebody does something to give, to be generous is, not because they're trying to get something out of it. We, we, yeah. we, have a lot, we have a lot more that we wanna give. And so if we treat it like it's just an e-commerce thing, then we, you might as well just let Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos figure everything out for us. And I don't wanna do that. Right, yeah. 
Anyone else have anything to share on that? I I I will say it is cool. We're gonna get to the positive we're, stuff. We're, like we're, we're actually we're gonna make that pivot right now. I I was uh, when I was presenting the other day, someone came up to me who's heard me present a lot of like, man, every time I listen to you, it's like like I hate listening to you because I get bummed. And and honestly, it was just like I I I take that res- seriously, but at the same time, I feel like I have a responsibility to share um, you know, my belief. But at the end of the day, I and I I can't speak for all of you, but I think I can is that we all believe in the power of philanthropy. Like if I did not, why would I be here? Like I wouldn't, it would be hard to wake up. People that are in our industry and have that altruistic sense of like the power of of philanthropy for good overwrites the fear. So we have these difficult conversations so that we can overcome challenges and we can be thoughtful about, you know, how we are caring for our industry. And so with that said, like we're gonna, we'll we'll make this pivot. We've talked a lot about the negative consequences, and I think we needed to. But what are some of the ways that you're all seeing, you know, positive outcomes of ChatGPT either right now and and even if you have a lens to the future, where do you see this technology really helping the nonprofit sector? Kenna, do you want to go first? Sure, everyone's being so polite. <laughs> um, I know. This, this may be a micro, a micro thing, but but um, you know, as a, a writer, as someone that helps people with persuasive communication, you know, so many people have just been <laughs> using this to write. And I've seen people say, you know, English not my first language. So you know, as a rhetoric scholar, remember, there's different kinds of Englishes. Um, there's standard written English. There's you know different Englishes, different dialects, different variants. Not ever. Most people weren't you know didn't learn standard English just around the world. And so for for some people. It's just kind of a godsend to be able to at least know that you're going to, your paragraphs are going to be constructed, your work is going to be grammatically correct. And I think um, for people that just have have tasks to do that require them to work in standard English, um, you know, that that don't don't aren't able to, you know, wouldn't otherwise be able to do that or again would have to hire a copywriter, you know, that I think is is a benefit that, you know, I just want to make sure it is um, that those systems are strong enough to support that. Um, that you don't need to know more than the system itself to make it work for you, which I think is some of the case. So I do think that that's the promise is really that chat function, which is what it's supposed to do, enabling it to write coherently in standard written English. That could really be a benefit for a lot of people in the sector. Yeah. It's it's powerful, actually. I, I will say I have two college kids and I, for whatever, it's my own bias because I was probably a horrible writer when I graduated college. And now I think I'm, I, I, I'm a decent writer, but um, I see what I see their writing ability, and I can see immediately how ChatGPT can help elevate their writing to be more co- coherent and and to be what I, I love the term when people refer to ChatGPT as a co-pilot to be that that co-pilot. I also think about every probably ninety percent of the disagreements we had around the dinner table or around um, our house in the evenings while my kids were in school was almost always about like checking their grammar on their papers. Like it never ended well. Like it was, my, my wife's an English major. Like it's like, well, proof this paper. And it's like, oh, you did it all wrong. I'm so glad to offload those fights to ChatGPT. It's like, you've got that tool, go edit yourself. And, uh, and, and honestly, I think there'll be a lot happier families without those, uh, those big disagreements. But I agree, especially with the language barrier, um, that levels the playing field from an equity perspective, levels the playing field if you have the technology in the, and the computer and, and all that stuff um, in a pretty dramatic way. What else? But, Mina, do you mind if I tell a quick story? So besides the fact that I think like even things like within Zoom, having generative, uh, you know, like the auto captions, right? Which is not, it's a level of artificial intelligence, but that type of stuff helps make these types of, of conversations more accessible for people. So that's great. But here's a very really practical thing that I did this week with ChatGPT4. Um, I, and Sam from my team is on here. So Sam, y- you know, thumbs up here. I wanted to overhaul our crisis communications plan. And cause I just think it's a good idea to have a well-established crisis communications plan. Um, I went, I found a nice template from HubSpot. I downloaded the template. I looked at it and I said, there was a lot to write here. And that had things where it's like, insert this language here. 
all I did was have that on one screen and chat GPT on the other. And I copied and pasted it in. And, but what I first said is, this is who you are. You are this company. And I loaded in our mission statement. And I said, this is everything that needs to guide you. Here's our values. So that's literally how I started the talk. So then it's like, okay, I need to reference back and not violate these values and not violate this. So that was fun to do. So there, the, the ethics can be done even natively. Then I just said, boom, boom, fill out this template. And it was even doing the boxes, the tables, like in Word that would get filled out. And all I had to do, it was wonky on formatting, but I would look, I would go, that's not our language, or I would change this, or we, now I need to go take this to our team and have a review process. I'm done with the chat. Yeah. Now the humans take over and we start to go, who assigns this? What do we say here? What are we missing? But the grunt work, it saved me probably, I, I don't know how many hours of work that would have even been without that thing. And now we have it. Yeah, huge efficiency boost and, and some expertise that you didn't have that you would have historically had to pay for, right? To have somebody come in and, you know, meet with your group and understand your values. Uh, crisis um, PR agencies are very expensive. Yeah, I would have, that would have been, you know, and and I think especially, especially for nonprofits. I mean, I one thing I love about, about ChatGPT is it's a, sorry about that. Well, Mina, why don't you go and I'll put myself on mute. Okay, all right. Um, I would say what are the things I'm using, I'm seeing ChatGPT positively for. I think ChatGPT right now is like that open playground where people are testing it out with different use cases and some things would stick and some things would, you know, probably not work. So what right now we have is not the end product. It's just the start to see what are the kind of different use cases can happen. In my case, I would say I I feel like I, I I like I love writing and I'm a decent writer and I can speak decent English. English is not my first language, but I would say um, the way I use Chat GPT is to help in my creativity because in day to day parts it's really tough to think. Okay, what should I write now um, for social media? What should I write now? Think about the ideas for those handwritten cards that I want to send something or. The, just the ideas. I don't want the whole thing fleshed out. I still want to use my brain power and my heart and my mind and my time into that part, but I want some kind of um, a friend who can at the start say, okay, here are your five things you can get started with. So um, those kind of generating those ideas, what you can write about in this week on your social channels, I've been using ChatGPT for that. And it's, it's, it's nice to have that kind of a friend right there. You're, you know, and you even talking about it as a friend is, is, uh, is so interesting. <laughs> Ken, Ken is smiling because she actually commented on this idea of this Eliza effect that we, we portray it as a friend. I have found myself thanking ChatGPT intuitively. And then I'm like, shoot, am I doing this just to appease the robot overlord? So when they take over, like I'll, you know, I'll have some friends um, or is it feeling real enough that it actually feels like a friend? I, I think your you know all of your comments are so great. The um the one thing I love about it, and again, sorry for the the fire truck that was just deciding to go by when we were I was talking, is that um, this is a great equalizer for any size nonprofit. I mean, it is AI democratized entirely, right? I mean, and I think especially for a nonprofit that has one or two people, you have a friend now. You don't have to you know call the lifeline and be like, hey, give me five creative ideas on how I could steward a donor. You have a friend that can you know, a chat GPT that can provide you a creative boost or a creative start to so many different things. Um, you know, again, I think going back to our earlier conversation, that risk being that if you offload all of it to a robot, there's a, there's some really significant consequences in, in our sector. And so we have only a few minutes left. I wanted to really conclude this conversation with, we talked about really some pretty dramatic um, downsides. We've talked about some positive you know, uh, outcomes, you know, right now and in the future even. So this ability to use this tool in lots of creative ways, it's just like, I, I mean, as something you said earlier, it's just like the biggest risk is not doing it. I 100% agree. This technology is, it's not crypto. This is something that is here to stay and it will get exponentially better. I mean, very fast and the haves and the have nots will be noticeable. So start doing it, get creative, test the limits of it, 
be aware of the downside, be aware that it can be convincingly wrong. Um, so fact checked and a uh, fact check and also, you know, engineering, prompt engineering, both those two skill sets that people need to learn. I want to get into a topic that I, I don't think a lot of people are brave enough to talk about in our industry. And as we are approached with, this is just one version of advanced technology, and there's a, a plethora of different AI tools that we, we kind of interface now, but will be presented with as a sector in the near future. And we're going to be presented with these, these technologies fast and furious. Is it possible that the nonprofit sector being special and being, you know, understanding the priority is around trust and authenticity, is it possible for the nonprofit sector to have a sense of a framework that we as a sector in thinking about the long-term implications of our healthy nonprofit sector, is it possible to have a framework that we could evaluate technology as good or bad? You know, I, I definitely want to hear Kenna's thoughts on this too. But one of the things that Nathan, I know we talked about, but I, I can formally say that we're going to be partnering with the Prindle Institute out of DePaul University later in uh, 2023. And we're going to kickstart a conversation specifically on the ethics of this data, not AI in general, but around all of this. And I think that if an outcome that we could start to coordinate as a sector through those conversations, like these conversations, is that's what we need to create. Absolutely. And I think the momentum is now for doing that. That's why I'm bringing up that event, Nathan. So let's talk about that. But totally. But I think it's possible if we. Many times I think what happens is that for-profit entities come in and they go, well, you're, you're a nonprofit. You don't know what you're doing. So right. we'll tell you how to do it. And if we can come in and go, eh, no, 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 no. This is how it works here. You're in our house now. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great. That would be powerful. Love that. Great, great comment. Yeah. Other thoughts on... I, sometimes I feel like I'm just so far out there. I'm like, we should have a framework, and people are like, "You're crazy! It'll never happen." But kind of what? What's your? What are your thoughts on that? It'd be great. We should start an organization and raise money for it <laughs> through chat. No, <laughs> but but yeah, I think it, it'd be it'd be great. It'd be fabulous um, because I do think there are going to be so many applications that are going to be integrated within our technology that. You know, they may tell us, hey, this thing works or do this, or we suggest that, you know, some transparency around what, where did you get that <laughs> conclusion of what, you know, what are these systems doing? I think to have, I think we will need one. And it's not just around chat GPT, as you said, it's around all these applications of machine learning. I think we should put one together um, if we can and, and get people on this call involved. I think, and thank you for that. I, I think when we're, our responsibility as a sector, when we're talking about AI, it almost always should be prefaced with the word responsible. I, you know, and I think that though even the word responsible means something different for us as a sector than it does even the private sector when they use the word responsible. There, they're trying to eliminate, you know, racist, ageist, ableist, Islamophobic algorithms. And responsible for us means we want it to support a vibrant, healthy philanthropic sector that is built on the, the, the the basis of trust and, and and authenticity right and so this idea that we all commit to using this word responsible and then you know having these conversations i i i uh, i too feel like it's it, it it can happen but i agree with tim if we don't create it it will be created for us and that will those values will not be aligned so mina what's your take on this yeah i would say um i agree with everything that we have just said and we have talked about the only thing that i would add is um any framework that we get started with we need to remember that it's not the final model of a framework we can evolve it it's not the once done and you know forget about it and now for years and years we have to keep implementing it it's going to grow just as the technology is growing just as the data is growing so knowing that i think that a framework is definitely possible um and the nerdy geeky me is trying to create one so i'm going to be reaching out to you outside of this phone call <laughs> how we can be doing that but um it's certainly possible well i'll, I'll give a real quick shameless or selfless plug even though it's not anything that i monetize or will and and um i think you're all familiar with it but i had this idea before uh 
COVID actually is creating a, a place where people can talk about the implications from privacy and security and ethics and quality under this idea umbrella fundraising.ai, which has really moved into, it's very nascent, but moved into a LinkedIn group of about 450 people now. And the idea is that we could start getting together at different places. The work that Tim was just talking about could be a place where we 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 point individuals who are interested in this this responsibility framework to hey, there's this thing on ethics, or hey, there's this, and and um and it takes a lot of shared ownership, um, but it's something that if you're interested in, for those that are listening, fundraising.ai on LinkedIn is just a member group and, and join. And I think um, if anyone's interested in being an admin or, or helping support that, Amina already is and, and several several others are, it's open. It's not owned by anyone. It's just a, a gathering place. Um, with that said, in our last four minutes, I wanted to just have an opportunity for some parting thoughts. I think for a lot of people in our sector, they're wondering, um, how do I learn more? Where do I learn more? I'm often asked the question, <clears throat> where do I get my information? <clears throat> Sorry. Where? Um, so for each of you, where would you tell people to go if they're in the nonprofit sector, they're wanting to learn more and know more and stay current on <clears throat> not just ChatGPT, but really this, this intersection of, of technology and nonprofit, where, do you, where would you tell them to go? Mina, has a, new, Mina yes. has a newsletter, so you could give us. Yeah, uh, I was going to say one. Mina's newsletter is actually a pretty, <laughs> pretty good one. I would suggest um, just as how you would explore a new street or how you would explore starting to talk to someone stranger on a bus. You would start asking questions. You would become curious. You would want to learn more. Just with the same curiosity. Um, Try ChatGPT, log into that platform and see how, what it can do. That's number one. Number two is definitely keep talking to your peers, keep you know creating space for these kinds of conversations. This one webinar is not enough, certainly not enough. And you need to take it back um, and talk with your team members and your nonprofit. And then probably if you are holding conferences and events, maybe create a space to talk about AI. You know, These are like tangential topics which can help people to think more. Awesome. Yeah. Can I, Tim? I, yeah, I, I think that that I think we need to start to evolve our our spaces and resources on this, too. I think there is a gap. There were some entities that I think could have been there, but but aren't necessarily meeting that call anymore when it comes to nonprofits in the space and and associations. You know, everybody's trying to figure out what the next wave is. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's them. I think that we need a different way to think about this, which is why it's going to be more decentralized, right? Because that's just how information goes. I do want to uh, end on my side by at least giving some very tactical, practical advice. I've been engaging the chat, the Q&A, okay. by the way. Uh, you don't need to put this is not chat GPT generated from a psychology standpoint, <laughs> at least from donor psychology. That's going to put it in the head. Like, don't talk about the purple elephant in the room. You've just talked about the then you're right. thinking about purple elephants. Don't put that in. Don't, don't, don't do that. Yeah. 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 I, I struggle with that too. Like, how do you, you know, is this human generated or not? I think we owe the responsibility of making sure that humans are a part yeah. of any communication that a nonprofit puts externally. That needs to be our commitment as a sector. Um, I do, you know, just wrapping up on this, uh, Thomas's last comment about those that should fear this brought, brought this up. Um, is you know consultants. I I heard from a consultant the other day who asked me like, well, when do we need to start paying attention? I'm like, it needs to be part of everyone's responsibility, right? Every person now can't just pretend that that the world is not shifting and the world is not advancing and very in very quickly. And so um, I would say learn. There's 87.7 million videos on ChatGPT on YouTube. Um, there's newsletters like like Mina's. There's uh, lots of things that Donor Search does and lots of other great. Uh, podcast as well. So we're really grateful that um, you joined us today for for um, this part two of the promise and perils of ChatGPT in the nonprofit sector. We hope you continue the dialogue with us. Um, join us in fundraising.ai and um, we will form a community that can create, I believe, you know, Kenna's words, create it, you know, I, I believe we could create a framework. I and and to Tim's point, we we have to, or it will be created for us. And so 
Thank you all um, from the bottom of my heart for joining me today and for your time and for your input. And thank you for the audience for joining uh, as well and, and wanting to learn more. And, and really what I view this as uh, caring for a, a really important sector in our, in our world. So Jay, we're at time. This is your cue to wrap this up. Thank you very much, Nathan. Thank you to each of you for doing this. Really do appreciate you. Um, and to the audience, uh, do stick around for one second, if you will. You'll find some information about how you'll get a copy of this coming to you via email and also information about the recording. So please do stay tuned for just a second. Also, I want to share with you that are, there are several episodes uh, related to ChatGPT and other artificial intelligence issues in this series, including a podcast that Nathan has done in the past, we'll make sure to include links in the follow-up email that you receive. So that might be of interest to you. Those are both from the perspective of talking about this in a, in a broad way, but also uh, some of the uh, practical uses that some uh, nonprofit shops have entertained and, and what their experiences have been like. We also have sessions coming up in this series that I hope you'll come and join us for, including one next Tuesday with Ryan Gennard, who's the author of Future Philanthropy, and he's also the head of advancement at the Australian National University. He'll be talking about nonprofit Moneyball. Um, or recruiting and coaching your winning fundraising team, which will be a lot of fun. And then on Thursday, we have Peter Heller, founder of Heller Fundraising, who will be talking about your capital campaign. Can you launch now? And finally, on the podcast, which we don't uh, generally advertise, but uh, it may be of interest to you as well. It's about the lives of the people behind the work that we do. Tony Myers is our guest this week, so you can download that wherever you get your podcasts. And coming up this weekend is Rajiv Vinokota, who is the president of the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, talking about his work. So please do check out all of that. You'll see links in the slides you're about to see. And one last note, which is that this series is built around your needs and interests. So that means that we can only be as good as the input you give us. It's sort of like chat GPT, except you'll be talking with an actual human. And the way to do that is to reach out to me. So you can do that. And I promise you, I'm not artificial, and no matter how I might sound from time to time. So all you have to do is reach out to me at J, that's J-A-Y, at donorsearch.net, or you can find me on LinkedIn, where I suspect you can find all of our panelists. And, um, uh, and I would encourage you to follow all of their work in the days ahead. So with that, I'm going to ask everybody to turn off their cameras and their mics and stay tuned for the next little bit. Uh, as you can find out more about the follow-up email. Take Thanks, care, everybody. everybody.